Play me a nerd, matey. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm in my bathrobe. I haven't even combed my hair yet. Having my coffee. Almost sounds like Evie, doesn't it? Hi, sweetie. Uh, a big hello to everybody. I know we, you haven't seen much of us lately, but uh, Mike's been busy at work. We wanted to do this quick video to get this out there to the world. Um, many, many of us know about the Australian child abuse hearings with Jehovah's Witnesses going on right now. And those are available on YouTube. All you have to do is, you know, just search for the Australian child abuse. Christian Sparlock, thank you. Um, he is posting these to his channel. And also, I believe it's Jake Control, J-A-A-K-E. Thank you guys, you know, for get, getting these on. And um, thank you to all my friends who have been sending me links and clips, you know, who are listening to this. And Charles Russell, you know, let me know about all the documents and stuff. Because this is big, everybody. I mean, doing the happy dance again. This is big because the Australian government, this commission, has released the Secret Elders book to the entire world. And I'm going to put the link to this book down below. So everybody can have this now. So this is really big and very exciting for those of us in the XJW community. You know, and these stories that we're hearing in these hearings are just heartbreaking. You know, so our heart goes out to all the victims. And we're so proud of all of you, you know, for speaking up and for telling your story. And this gives, you know, hope and encouragement to the rest of, you know, who have been victims. So, anyway, I'm going to play the clip and um, I'm going to say good morning. And you guys all have a great day. Uh, entitled Branch, Branch Organization, January 2015. Um, published in 2012 by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. And would I be right to understand that this is the current version of this manual? Yes, January 2015. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and this is the document that was produced uh, in answer to my call earlier today. That's correct. And as a uh, coordinator of the Australia branch, I take it you're reasonably familiar with this manual? Yes. And I'd like to take you to some parts of it and then ask you some uh, questions that follow. Um, starting with Chapter 1, do you have Chapter 1, Headed Governing Body and Governing Body Committee? Do you have another copy of this document? Um, and in paragraph 1, it provides that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses is made up of brothers who are anointed servants of Jehovah God. They have the responsibility for giving direction and impetus to the kingdom work. And some scriptures are quoted, or cited rather. And then it says, like its first century counterpart, the governing body today looks to Jehovah, the universal sovereign, and to Jesus Christ, the head of the congregation, for direction in all matters. Now, that's what it says is is that the practice is that how it works that's correct yes and in paragraph four the governing body gives final approval for new publications as well as new audio and video programs is that right that's correct and, and uh, skipping one sentence it says as the representatives of the governing body in their assigned territory Branch committee members must faithfully implement and follow the direction coming from God's word and the faithful and discreet slave. Now, firstly, just to understand the reference to the faithful and discreet slave, that's a reference to the governing body, am I right? That's synonymous, yes. Yes. And so are we to understand this, that the branch committee members must faithfully and implement and follow the direction given by the governing body? So, yes. Uh, to summarize, then, is it the case that the, this manual sets out the rules by which the Jehovah's Witness organization internationally operates? Yes, from the governing body and the branch. It's branch organizations has direction for branch committees. Yes. 
And so when uh, the branch, uh, I beg your pardon, when the governing body gives the directive um, to the branch to deal with something in a particular way, uh, it, this, is, this is the document which sets up the governing body's authority to do that and the branch's obligation to obey. Is that right? Yes. It... Mr. O'Brien, I've discussed this with other witnesses, but uh, the Bible was, of course, written by people who lived a long time ago. Yes. Um, and who lived in a particular political and social structure. True, yes. For example, slavery was still part of everyday life. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and as taking that as an instance, society generally, not everywhere, but society generally, and certainly in Western society, has moved on where slavery is no longer permitted. True. Yeah. And that's an illustration of social change. Yes. Right. Um, now, the learnings that you take from the Bible and then, and then translate into uh, obligations, as I presently understand it, in many instances, are um, learnings that were created in order to benefit and create a stable and healthy society more than 2,000 years ago. Correct, yes. Um, is it open to the Jehovah's Witnesses to take another look and ask the question whether what the Bible says was appropriate for those times remains the obligation of the 21st century? So that's the... Um, issue in, with the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament and the Greek Scriptures or the New Testament, that was a significant change in Bible law and Bible understanding. And much of the Christian era, from the recorded in the Greek Scriptures or the New Testament, uh, basically is principles rather than laws and commandments, although it does still contain some laws. But the Mosaic law that the nation of Israel had lived by that was done away with Christ. And so the principles, we, we believe many of them, are timeless in any place, any um, time. Well, that's the question. That's your belief. Yes. Um, and I was careful to say there are principles which you have accepted as obligations. And that's, that's the position, isn't it? Yes, that can be, yes. Um, but um, is it open to Jehovah's as perhaps you've done with slavery, I mean, I assume that Jehovah's Witnesses would find slavery abhorrent. Yes, yeah, right. particularly that. Whereas the New Testament accepts it. It was a, a different type of slavery to what generally is like the, the African slavery that was taking place in the, those centuries, the settlement of the empires. Uh, the slavery back then was much more like a, an employed person um, Not the impression I have of Rome. In, in the well, yeah, the, the Christian era in the household of Christians, it was that way. The Bible gives counsel to masters who had slaves how they were to treat their slaves, not the way the Romans did. They weren't exactly employees, though, were they? No, but they were cared for. Um, they were, but they were different. Anyway, the point I'm making was different to the type of slavery people associate with, so the African Americans. Well, at the centre of the issues that the Commission is concerned with, of course, as you know, is the process whereby the Jehovah's Witnesses receive, investigate and determine allegations of sexual abuse. Right. You understand that? Yes, I do. Yes. And you understand the discussion we've had about the difficulties that women might face in expressing their intimate um, concerns to three men in, in, in uh, the tribunals that you've provided. I do, and, and that's why I think Mr Spinks made the point yesterday that that just doesn't happen nowadays, that unless the, the woman wanted to face her accuser... No, it's not the accuser, we're talking about the, the, adjudic the abuser, adjudicator. Sorry. Yeah. So um, if it's a matter of gathering evidence, the, the principle is that 
the elders who are going to investigate the matter simply need to be convinced that the statement or receive the statement from the victim. That can be done any number of ways. She doesn't have to sit and face three elders because there's no clear Bible principle that says that she must do that. So. But nevertheless, she's disclosing her intimate details to three men. Well, not necessarily, I think, Your, Your Honour. But she can meet one elder, depending on the age of the person. All right. It's historical. Ultimately, the adjudication process will require three men. Three men, but she may not need to be involved after she's provided her statement. After she's given the intimate details. Yes. Correct. Now, is there room for women to be involved in the investigation and decision-making process? Well, that's one of the points we need to take back and discuss, give that much more consideration than we have, because that, if it's based upon the Bible um, standard, then we would present that to the governing body as one of the recommendations from the Commission. We certainly, I can see the, uh, the point being made with it, and I don't see why a woman couldn't be involved in the process, particularly in establishing the, the victim's uh, statement, so she doesn't have to face three men. Now, as I understand it, the role of a woman in early Christian society was quite different to the role which women have in Western society today. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, I'd say that's true. And the Bible, in identifying men as the leaders and thus you've turned that into the elders, was reflecting the social structure that existed in those communities in those days, wasn't it? It was. Now, society has changed in the Western world and change and continues to change in relation to the role of women, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. Now, why would it be that the Jehovah's Witnesses would stay with a structure that is reflected in a society of 2,000 years ago and not one that's a contemporary society today? I think the, the fundamental issue, Your Honour, is whether or not we accept the Bible as being the Word of God and God as the, the, the sovereign has the, the right to decide on those matters. So that, that's how we view the Bible. Uh, but we realise that society in general doesn't have that view. No, but you've, you've moved away from a number of the precepts of early Christian society. We, we discussed slavery, but uh, I think yesterday I discussed with one of your colleagues uh, the role of women in, in the church itself and their capacity to speak and so on. You probably heard that. Yes, so, I heard the discussion. Yeah. I mean, a number of things have been put to one side or um, have been changed. Yes, yeah, so... If a review of our process, um, which we will take back, I'll take that definitely back to our branch committee and our service department personnel to, to just have another good look at the procedures and if we can see a need to make some adjustments in that, that's what we would recommend to the governing body. There's no, no question on that. So that is it right to understand that if the evidence from this commission and the gathered expertise of professional people suggest that your process, by not involving women at the decision-making level, was a flawed process, would it be open to change? I definitely think it is open to change. It always is. We've been reviewing the process for years, decades. So. I'm specifically asking about the decision. Would it be open to change the composition of the decision-making body? Of the Judicial Committee? Mm. Yeah, I, I can't see how it could, personally, but then I'm, I'm not the decision-maker on that. That would be the governing body. But scripturally... So um, some, some things can change. For example, the role of women in the church and their capacity to speak. But whether or not women are decision-makers can't change. Is that the idea? As I understand it. Now, why is that? Well, because the, the scriptures are very clear that uh, an overseer or an elder has to be a man. There's no provision in the scriptures for a woman to be an overseer. And it's the elders who are the shepherds and would judge in these matters. 
and what, you've, what your process does at the moment is exclude them from the decision-making compartment altogether, doesn't it? So when you refer to the decision-making... The determination me, of whether or not the allegation is true. Excuse me, no, 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 women could be involved in that step. So that could be involved in that step. So that's the point I was trying to make. To, as decision-makers? To, well, she's listening to the comment. For example, the mother listens to her daughter. Um, no, she, no, 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 no. We're talking about the processes which you have for determination and ultimately judicial determination of the truth of the allegation. Those processes at the moment exclude men. We've agreed on that. Exclude women. So oh, men, exclude yes. women. Um, no, I don't think it so entirely because women can be involved in the... That's talk, talking about the investigation process. No, not I'm talking about the decision-making process. Whether or not it is... Whether or not it's true. Yes. So I, I don't... Women are presently excluded from that decision, are they not? No, they could be involved in the discussions with uh, the el elders who have been investigating it. Like, there are many situations where uh, women have perhaps been involved in talking to the victim or maybe the victim's only comfortable to talk to a woman. She's sharing her observations with the elders. That, like, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing. Well, I think I've exhausted my capacity to get to the real issue. But Mr Brown, perhaps can we put like this, leaving the word involved out of it. On the present structure, a woman cannot be a decision the allegation is on whether or not sufficiently proved. The allegation is... She wouldn't be one of the two elders investigating. I could yes. narrow it down to that. So she cannot be the decision maker. And equally on the judicial committee, a, a woman cannot be a decision maker. A woman might be involved, giving evidence right. or whatever, but can't be a decision maker. And that's no. as to whether, having listened to it all, you have identified aspects of your process which seem to you to require uh, re-examination and change. Yes, I think uh, a number of areas have come up for consideration that we need to now go back and look at much more carefully. Complete clarity in the mind of those, what the process is all about, because I think that is a weakness that's been identified that needs clarification. Heard quite a bit about the question of the sufficiency of evidence, in, in other words, what's been referred to as the two witness rule. Uh, firstly, from what you've heard and the way in which it operates, do you consider it to be justified? Yes, again, because we accept that scriptural direction that did come from Christ himself. When it comes to the ju Judicial Committee hearing itself, uh, unless there's a confession or two other independent witnesses, it will be necessary for the victim herself to give evidence. Okay. Now, she, she would have been able to do that in a written statement, she wouldn't need to appear before the Judicial Committee or before the um, accused. Well, what about the requirement that the victim must face her attacker? No. I'm... As it's put differently, that the accused has a right to be faced by his accuser? In the, I think the information that's been presented from the um, shepherding book indicates that that's not necessarily the case if the, not even limiting it to child abuse, it's as even if the vic victim is timid, they may not feel capable to face the accused. If that's the case, the elders would quite happily accept a written right, statement. possible outcomes of a judicial committee hearing. Um, reproval, of course, leaves a known offender in the congregation and and in the family, if the offender's um, in a family, not so. Yes. And disfellowshipping leaves a known offender uh, in the family and or at large in the community. That's not true. So. And both the, those problems can only be resolved with systematic reporting to the authorities. Would you agree? Yes. I, well, that's true. It re but it doesn't necessarily remove the person, as I understand, from the community. If they were imprisoned, it would, but once they're released, 
you still face the same dilemma that we do, that the person's no. free in the community. Is this, Mr O'Brien, is, is that you, as the Jehovah's Witness organisation, don't have the power to intervene in a family in such a way as to ensure protection of children. You can give advice and counsel, but you can't really do more than that, can you? No, that's correct. Yeah, we can take child, over. Child protection authorities in certain circumstances can. I yes. had heard yesterday that um, senior counsel representing the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia um, said that Mr Jackson would not be likely to be able to assist this commission because his role is in the translation of matters. Now that you accept as a clear variance to what you've explained in your evidence? No, sorry, it's not. Um, the translation it comes under the writing committee, as I understand, which is what Mr Jackson is a member of. So. Yes, but he's also the coordinator of the teaching committee that has many other responsibilities and not translation, not so. Yeah, he, as a member of the governing body, he has yes, a number. Can you but explain, Mr O'Brien, how it came about that senior counsel representing your organisation was given instructions that Mr Jackson's role is confined to the translation matters when it clearly is not? His role, as I understand, is principally translation. Uh, but translation is part of the writing committee. He shared, as a governing body member, he has um, numerous functions to perform, not just as a translator. Yes, indeed. And as a consequence of those numerous functions, he would have knowledge across a whole scope of activity of the governing body, not so. I guess he would have... Far um, beyond translations. Yes, yeah, more than translation. Mr O'Brien, did you give those instructions to senior counsel? The instructions regarding Mr Jackson? Yes. Um, it led me to believe that there was little that Mr Jackson could add to the discussion. And no doubt that's what you expected would happen. Is that right? Uh, that's true. and I still concur with that. Well, I'm starting to form a totally different impression, I have to tell you. Well, if I could explain that Mr Jackson, his two principal roles, as far as I understand in the governing body, are with the writing and um, the other committee. I mean, the, the two committees I've mentioned, the, the writing, and pa part of that is, involves um, translation. Mr Jackson uh, was in the Pacific Islands for many years, uh, understood many of the Pacific Island languages, helped... Well, I understand that he may have a role in translation, but I'm now coming to understand he has a significant role in relation to teaching, but also the general affairs of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I, he don't, wouldn't have involvement in matters to do with the Coordinators Committee, which handles legal, nor with the Service Committee which handles service matters. But he sits at the top with others in relation to all of those committees, doesn't he? No, they are different governing body members are assigned specifically to different committees. I understand that, but nevertheless, the governing body, I assume, has the ultimate say in all things. When things come back to them as a governing body, yes. And he's a member of that? Yes, he's a member of the governing body. He's yeah. here in Australia. He's with his father. Well, I understand he's still in Australia. I don't talk with Mr Jackson, but I understand his father is um, gravely ill, very close to death, and that's why he's here, to be with his father.